we can trace the Y chromosome back to one male Y chromosomal ancestor. That combined with the uh, mitochondrial DNA and how similar worldwide <clears throat> mitochondrial DNA is compared with, uh, in contrast, in correlation with the low genetic diversity, that's how we can conclude, okay, we came from just two people, right? Because that's why the evolutionists had to invent the hypothetical population bottleneck of, say, 10,000. I mean, do you hold to more of a 2,000 population bottleneck or was it 10? Like, I've heard different theoretical um, numbers. I don't know. I have to go. I have to kind of go by what the consensus is. I've heard Francis Collins. Or I read that he wrote. Yeah, he thought it was about ten thousand. Yeah, I would, I would tend to trust his opinion on the matters since I'm not an expert in it. So I believe he said around around ten thousand. Um, and just from other information I gather, I don't really see a problem with uh, the low level of diversity in the human population because uh, we see the same thing on island populations. Uh, there's no difference. Uh, so those would go through bottlenecks, uh, of course, uh, speciation events on on islands and they show the same uh, variation uh, as as we do um, a species here on the mainland there was there was a, a paper published pretty recently that came out you're probably familiar with it that showed all current well, about 90 percent of current uh, species kind of came into uh, being if you want to call it that around around 200,000 years ago correct um, so based yeah. on the ones that they had studied and they all show very similar the same same uh, percentage of, of variation within groups I guess, um, and, and yes, I, I do want to probably go possibly in depth into that paper, which is good. But before we go on, I guess that rabbit trail, when it comes to the low genetic diversity, the population bottleneck, Y chromosome atom, you know, mitochondrial, for example, um, as you know, if evolution and deep time is true, over deep time, millions of years, millions and millions of years, I should say, any large population like that would most certainly accumulate massive numbers of mutations. And then that would result in, of course, basic genetics would tell us enormous amounts of genetic diversity. So as I was saying earlier, that's a pretty serious problem for evolutionary theory, because what we now know about mankind is that we have, as a human species, very limited genetic variation, right? So then the evolutionist came up with the evolutionary out of Africa bottleneck theory, right? So for us, obviously, if we came from just two people, that means limited diversity is easy to explain. It's exactly what we, we would expect. But when it comes to um, the evolutionary model, that, that near extinction event, I would agree, yes, it's going to reduce homogeneity. So that is a feasible way to explain the low genetic diversity. But the problem is, uh, Aaron, is that it would cause permanent and severe genetic damage, right? That just means because these enormous numbers of deleterious mutations that are accumulating due to the inbreeding, they would then go to fixation. So my question is pretty simple. I'll say it like this, or I'll ask it like this. How could such a tiny, nearly extinct, of course, they'd be genetically compromised due to the inbreeding, how could that population of, say, 10,000, like you said, we can hold to Francis Collins' um, view on that. How could they suddenly explode in all parts of the planet and seize dominion over the entire world, being so genetically compromised, Aaron? Take your time. Uh, I think you kind of got the order of things kind of uh, backwards. Like, we, we didn't uh, come up with the out of Africa theory or uh, like a bottleneck from the like a Toba eruption or something because to explain the genetic diversity among humans. I mean, that stuff was already established years ago through uh, paleontology, uh, fossil record, and also tracing uh, the history of languages, uh, language development. And you can make um, phylogenetic, if you are, you know, similar trees, just based on language that, that have align with the trees made from the fossil record. So the chances of all of those, um, all of those um, lineages l lining up um, seems like pretty good evidence to me that like our current understanding is is correct um, and you asked about uh, well re real quick before because I just I want to clarify are you saying that they came up with the out of Africa the hypothetical population bottleneck after they discovered that as a human population we have limited genetic diversity are you is, is that your uh, position 
No, no, we, we've known about that bef before we were able to <laughs> and, and the, 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 the genetic data just confirms that we already um, hypothesized and already, already knew from the evidence. Well, from my understanding, because I believe it was Dr. Cy Gart, and I'd have to just double check, the evidence for the population bottleneck comes from genetics because <clears throat> mankind in general has such significant um, low genetic diversity, right? In, in mitochondrial DNA as well and, and Y chromosome. So therefore to explain such limited homogeneity, they concocted the story of the out of Africa population bottleneck because there's actually multiple theories, right? There's the multi-regional theory, well, but there's the out of Africa theory. So I, I'm it's, it's not concocted. Like we look at evidence and we see what that ev evidence uh, seems to tell us. Right. And then we and then we try and kind of deduce, uh, you know, hypothetical deductive model to kind of deduce what could have caused the, um, you know, things we're seeing. Like um, maybe there was some sort of catastrophic event that occurred around this same time period that matches the rates of mutations that we see that, that cause a, a bottleneck. And then if we find something like that, like this volcanic eruption, uh, then that will uh, help us help support our hypothesis even more. So. It's kind of like with the chromosome number two, we predicted that in advance. <laughs> and then now it's, um, it's not disputed at all uh, anymore that chromosome number two was the result of the head-to-head -head fusion of two, two uh, chromosomes that re remain separate in the great apes. Apologize for um, the clarification. What did you say Sigart was talking about? Uh, Sigart was it, was, it was during my debate with Erica, we were going over this same, this same problem. And I asked Erica, you know, how they came up with this population bottleneck. And I believe it was Seigart in the comment section who was stating that it's in our genetics where they come up with the population bottleneck of 10,000, some say 2,000, because that's the only feasible way they're going to be able to explain the um, limited homogeneity that we have as, as a human species because as i explained earlier if evolution is true well we should have enormous amounts of genetic diversity because these large populations would be accumulating enormous numbers of mutations and even if i conceded that maybe there was some type of near extinction event based on this volcanic eruption i do want to go on record uh, saying that there are a lot of <clears throat> scientists and experts in the field that agree that there are some inconsistencies with that uh, volcanic eruption leading to the near extinction event i would just have to probably uh, provide those sources after but even if i conceded that you know, I'm still looking for an answer as to how that hypothetical population could have exploded in all parts of the world. Because based on the inbreeding, based on the extended bottleneck, the extended nature of it, it wasn't just one generation or two generations or even 10 generations. Um, how did they seize dominion over the entire planet? They would have been so genetically compromised that just that this just is not feasible other than um, uh, storytelling. So I'd ask, why would why would they be genetically compromised? What do you mean by that? Uh, so the reason why they would be genetically compromised is because that population bottleneck would include enormous numbers of deleterious mutations going to fixation. Because as you know, inbreeding exposes the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes. So if there's an extended near extinction event, for say hundreds of generations or just a, many generations in general, the resulting inbreeding would cause permanent and severe genetic damage. And yet we're supposed to believe that 70,000 years ago, this genetically compromised population of homo sapiens suddenly exploded into all parts of the world, thus seizing dominion over the world. I mean, it's just not, it's not feasible. I mean, we would need some type of explanation for how, how that could be possible. Oh, can you? I don't understand. I, I just I don't understand um, where you're getting this information from. Like, why would why would the genome just build up one by one different like single nucleotide changes or whatever the mutation may be, um, and then just continually continuously get uh, worse and worse until those things get fixed? I don't really I'm not really following. Logic well, there. Are, are you disagreeing with the fact that that evolutionary bottleneck hypothesis does involve an extended and lengthy near extinction event 
and thus resulting in severe inbreeding and genetic damage. I mean, that's just the nature of bottlenecks and inbreeding. Look at the cheetahs today. I just, I just looked it up the other day and the cheetahs are now down to like 7,000 because they are inbreeding. They have experienced a genetic bottleneck as well. Their sperm is degenerate. Many recessive mutations are coming to the forefront. I mean, conservationists are looking at them and they're seriously concerned that this population of cheetahs are going to go extinct. I mean, it's a, it's a very serious problem, but I don't see these cheetahs being in such a compromised state, suddenly exploding into all parts of the world, seizing dominion over the world. But that's what you're trying to say happened 70,000 years ago with this hypothetical population of 10,000 homo sapiens. So if we see today that this leads to severe genetic damage, how is this remotely feasible other than, you know, ad hoc, post hoc storytelling, of course? Uh, I don't think it requires storytelling. I mean, it, um, uh, cheetahs, I think we can kind of set them aside because a uh, uh, different animal, uh, different types of environment, different types of environmental pressures um, than humans would have. So a separate topic, interesting topic, but a, a separate one. Um, um, as far as uh, the buildup of deleterious mutations, um, uh, there's, there's lots of ways for you not to get just some like linear buildup. It's all bad. And then it's going to end up in some homogenized state where the the um, species goes extinct. Um, well, I, I, and, I, and I understand um, what you're saying there. I think that more so has to do with long-term genetic degeneration, like for example, genetic entropy, which we can get into, right? We accumulate 100 new mutations per person per generation. Per generation, I understand that, you know, we could argue all day as to how many of those are completely neutral, how many of those are beneficial. Um, but when it comes to the population bottleneck story, we're just simply talking about the result <clears throat> of inbreeding. Right. Because I always say that inbreeding, it's like a sneak preview of where we are going genetically as, as a species. I mean, that's why. Um, the reduced life expectancy of, say, inbred children, well, that's reflecting the overall aging of, of the genome because what's happening is the, the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes, they're being revealed, the ones that have been accumulating over time. So this small population of, say, 10,000, some believe 2,000, and I definitely don't want to beat a dead horse, but I've never personally received a good answer as to how a genetically compromised population such as that, which I believe correlates perfectly with the highly degenerate population of cheetahs we see today, could have actually exploded into all the world and then seized dominion over the planet, right? I mean, some say they assimilated with the Neanderthals and Denisovans and the other so-called human species. Others say that they killed them off, right? Like I said, there's different theories, multi-regional um, out of Africa. So I just see stories coming from the, uh, the evolutionists and I think we might just have to agree to disagree on that. I'll just have to say, I don't think you sufficiently answered the question regarding the hypothetical you know, population bottleneck of, of 10,000. I mean, there's just no feasible way that such a genetically compromised population uh, no, due to the inbreeding. Why, but but, because I, I think you're more so addressing long-term degeneration, right? Uh, and and we, can, we can shift to that because one thing you did say that I did take note of is that selection happens and on the phenotype, right? Because selection, would you agree selection happens on the level of the whole organism, right? Like does selection act on phenotype or genotype? It acts on phenotype, but you need to adjust what your definition of phenotype is. It's not just the morphology of the um, of the the creature that we're describing, or of the, of the life form that we're describing, it's it's also um, deeper than that. So on the molecular level, it's the proteins. The proteins are also that right. they can express are also part of, part of that phenotype. But one single point mutation on, say, a single nucleotide, if it's not harmful enough for selection to see then selection is not going to act on it is my point right it has to be phenotype ultimately that selection acts upon that's why my position is that selection acts on the best beneficial mutations right we can talk all day about beneficial mutations that um, say add 
new novel information to the genome, for example, or we can talk about the worst detrimental mutations because then natural selection, of course, they can rid the population of the most deleterious of mutations. But my position is that selection cannot stop the loss of information that's actually immeasurably small be, due to the low impact mutation accumulation. Because as you said, that's actually happening on the molecular level, right? So even if, let's say, even if only 10 of those 100 new mutations per person per generation were deleterious and the other 90 were completely neutral, that alone is still too much for long-term um, genetic advancement. I mean, there's got to be a type of selection that can select away <laughs> such low impact. And I understand there's, you know, there's redundancy in the genome. And I understand the things that you're saying. There are mechanisms, right? Synergistic epistasis, um, the cryptic variants that you're talking about. But ultimately, there's still a percentage of those 100 new mutations that are deleterious. So what type of selection is going to rid the population of those ones, I guess, would be my uh, question, Aaron. Take just, as much just, time as you just to yeah. clarify, so um, standing, your objection is, is that if there was a population bottleneck of 10,000, then that would create too much similarity in the genome to be able to repopulate the Earth. Is that your argument? Right. It would be like the cheetahs that we see today. They're so genetically compromised due to the inbreeding. They're so genetically similar. There's, there's, there's too many recessive mutations that have come to the forefront. And that's exactly what would, ha would have happened in the population bottleneck. I believe they say it's about 70,000 years ago. There'd be prolonged inbreeding. And, and so in that specific case, it's the inbreeding that's the problem. And we can see a reflection of that in the cheetahs today. I mean, they were at 10,000 at one point. I just looked it up the other day. They're now down to 7,000, you know, like conservationists are extremely worried about the What was what the was cheetahs. the lowest? What was the lowest the population of cheetahs ever ever got? Right now is I believe is the lowest. It's at um so, I mean, at, at 7,000 at the bottleneck that accounts for the homogeneity that you see they have today, like what was the number of individuals? Right. Good question. Good question. I believe that it's similar to the uh, population bottleneck of humans, right? There's some that say 2,000, 10,000. I've heard some papers that describe them as 30,000 because all they're doing is they're looking at the genetic data. They're looking at the limited genetic homogeneity and, and they the, are what's the coming up genome with size compared to the human genome size. So we have we have three billion letters. Obviously, mom passes on three billion. Dad passes passes on three billion. So six billion letters. Are you asking how many DNA letters are in the cheetah? Uh, how many genes uh, genes that are expressed in cheetahs versus I think humans have around twenty one to twenty five thousand genes. Right. What's okay. The, what's so the number in cheetahs. Right. Non coding versus protein coding. I'm not sure how many are in cheetahs. Do you know? I don't know, but I think that uh, would be... I got a question for you. So, as far as I know, cheetahs uh, don't intermingle much they have very close-knit packs and which is why their genetic deterioration is so much greater even though they still have a population which would potentially be able to support um growth genetic growth yeah Whereas it's like I inbreeding think, inbreeding within inbreeding so right so uh, the, the problem effect. is that they're like in little subgroups and they're not mm -hmm. really diversified in the seven thousand that do exist which is the problem well, and, and that's an interesting point too, Tom, because a lot of papers that I have read too is that there would have been subgroups very similar to the cheetah subgroups that we see today in that hypothetical population of 10,000 Homo sapiens 70,000 years ago. It's a very, very similar population bottleneck to what we see in the cheetahs. And I'm not saying that they would have went extinct right away, but we're not going to be seeing these 7,000 cheetahs that are incredibly genetically compromised suddenly seize dominion over the entire planet. Like supposedly the 10,000 Homo sapiens 70,000 years ago did. 